You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie the American. And I'm Johanna the Austrian, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. It's a podcast hosted by two women who never met in real life, but who have become very close friends. One might say intimate friends, if we would use lingo from 150 years ago. Absolutely. Over the last five years or so. That is when we started this podcast, and now we meet in this virtual space once a week to talk about true crime, history, and the paranormal. This week, though, we have a story that is not paranormal. It might be true crime, but it's probably not. It's also not really old-timey, but it is truly international. An Austrian, a Swiss, an American, and an Israeli walk into the jungle. And no, that's not the beginning of some ridiculous joke, but the beginning of some true fresh hell, because only two would walk back out of the jungle alive. Today, we want to tell you a story of survival, strength, and the hope to find your way out of the Bolivian wilderness. This is a big story. There's a lot to talk about. So this will be a two-part episode. We know that some of you like to wait until the second part comes out in order to listen to it all at once, and that's totally fine. Yeah, I'm mostly like that as well. My memory is now such that I will listen to the episode to part one when it comes out. And then when part two comes out, I'll listen to part one again and then also to part two because <laughs> I can't remember anything. The most important source for this episode was the book Back from Tuiki. And I really hope I pronounced it correctly. I, I checked it out and they said it's Tuiki, the river. The harrowing life and death story of survival in the Amazon rainforest written by one of the survivors. Now, I can absolutely recommend this book, but I want to give a slight content warning. There's a bit of animal cruelty in this book. We won't be mentioning this any further. And of course, I know this is a story of survival and killing animals for food is to be expected. But that's not really what I'm referring to, even though the hunting parts were a bit too detailed for me. Uh, if I can be completely honest, but I'm more referring to a story involving a dog. And yeah, so just just a slight warning there, uh, no further details. But it is an amazing story and it's worth knowing the story. All of this takes place in Bolivia. Bolivia is nestled in the heart of South America. It's a landlocked country bordered by Brazil to the north and east, Paraguay and Argentina to the south, Chile to the southwest, and Peru to the west. The country's diverse landscape include the Andes Mountains, the Amazon Basin, and the Gran Chaco region. The capital city, La Paz, is situated in the western part of the country, while Sucre serves as the constitutional capital. Uh, fun fact, did you know that La Paz is considered to be the world capital located at the highest altitude? Because I honestly had no idea. If you would have asked me, I would have guessed it was Bhutan's capital or maybe Kathmandu in Nepal. But no, nope, it's La Paz. Number two is Quito in Ecuador. Wow. So that was interesting. It's surprising, definitely. For some reason, La Paz is tickling my lyric brain and I feel like I have sang about La Paz in a show before. It's like, I can't call back the lyric. Many of our brilliant listeners came through after last week with photos of a canceling hammer, which is a very lethal looking weapon indeed, like a, like a hammer with a long, longer than usual handle sort of, and a very blunt edge. And I feel like someone is going to know what I'm talking about. La Paz. I can't. It's Cole Porter. I don't know. All right. Let's get back to our story. Someone out there is immediately like, yes, you're talking about the lyrics from something, but it's, it's going to bother me. All right. So Bolivia has truly such an interesting history, a diverse geography, and vibrant cultural heritage. Long before the arrival of Spanish conquistadores, Bolivia was home to an advanced indigenous civilization. The Tiwanaku Empire, centered around Lake Titicaca, flourished from around 500 to 1000 AD. 
Its monumental archaeological site, Tiwanaku, still stands as a testament to the engineering and architectural prowess of this ancient civilization. That's because the Tiwanaku people were accomplished architects, constructing impressive structures that showcased advanced engineering skills. They also left behind intricate stone carvings and sculptures, often featuring geometric patterns, anthropomorphic figures, and zoomorphic motifs. The Tiwanaku people developed advanced agricultural techniques, including raised fields and terracing, to make the most of the challenging Andean environment. These innovations allowed them to cultivate crops at high altitudes. The Tiwanaku Empire started to decline around the 11th century. There is much speculation among scholars as to why this happened. Following the decline of Tiwanaku, the Inca Empire extended its reach into the region. The Inca influence can be seen in various parts of Bolivia, particularly in the city of Pumapunku and the awe-inspiring landscapes surrounding the Andes. In the 16th century, Spanish conquistadors led by Francisco Pizarro and Diego de Almagro arrived in the Andean region. Bolivia, rich in silver deposits, became a focal point of Spanish interest. Potosí, located in present-day Bolivia, emerged as one of the wealthiest cities in the world due to its lucrative silver mines. The Cerro Rico, which translates to Rich Mountain, was a symbol of the Spanish exploitation of Bolivia's natural resources. The harsh conditions of the mines, coupled with the forced labor of indigenous people as well as enslaved African people, led to immense suffering and exploitation. The legacy of this colonial period is deeply ingrained in Bolivia's history, and it would influence its socio-economic landscape for centuries to come. Bolivia, like many South American nations, fought for its independence from Spanish rule in the early 19th century. Most of you have probably heard the name Simón Bolívar. He was a key figure in the fight for freedom, and played a crucial role in liberating Bolivia in 1825. And, of course, the country was named in his honor. So maybe you're like, wait then, what was Bolivia called before all of that? And before it gained its independence, Bolivia was part of the Spanish vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata. The region that is now Bolivia was known as Upper Peru, Alto Peru in Spanish, during the colonial period. The term Upper Peru referred to the geographic location of the territory in relation to the vice royalty which encompassed a vast area in South America. Throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, Bolivia experienced territorial changes due to conflicts with neighboring countries. The War of the Pacific, from 1879 to 1884, resulted in the loss of Bolivia's access to the Pacific Ocean, a grievance that still echoes in the nation's politics and identity. I can imagine. I hate it when you see these countries, and it's like, wait, how come they didn't get any coast? Just no coast. There are so many of them. The 20th century witnessed significant political instability in Bolivia with numerous coups and changes in government. Indigenous populations, who had been marginalized for centuries, began to organize and demand social justice. The latter half of the century saw a rise in social movements, culminating in the election of Evo Morales in 2006, the country's first indigenous president. Morales's presidency marked a shift toward a more inclusive and indigenous-focused government. However, his tenure also faced controversies, and he eventually resigned in 2019 amidst allegations of electoral fraud. Bolivia's political landscape continues to evolve, reflecting a complex interplay of social, economic, and cultural forces. Today, environmental challenges, including deforestation and climate change, pose significant concerns for Bolivia's future. The nation, with its diverse ecosystems ranging from the Amazon rainforest to the high Andean plateau, is actively addressing these issues while striving for sustainable development. Today's story takes place in the 1980s. How was life in Bolivia in those days? Well, the 1980s were definitely a challenging period for Bolivia, marked by political and economic turbulence, social unrest, and the struggle against the illicit drug trade. Uh, Bolivia experienced frequent changes in government during the 1980s, and the country faced political instability 
with multiple presidents taking office in quick succession. The country also faced economic hardships characterized by hyperinflation, debt crisis and austerity measures. The country's economy heavily relied on the export of minerals and fluctuations in global commodity prices had a very significant impact on Bolivia's economic stability. And of course, there was also the 80s cocaine boom and drug trade, the rise of the cocaine trade in Bolivia, particularly in the region of Chapare. The illegal cultivation of coca plants and the production of cocaine escalated, leading to increased involvement in the global drug trade. Protests, strikes and demonstrations were common as various sectors of society, including workers and indigenous groups, expressed their dissatisfaction with economic policies. The connection between the drug trafficking and political instability led to rise of narco-terrorism, where drug cartels became involved in supporting or influencing political activities. This further complicated the political landscape in Bolivia, of course. And then the United States became increasingly involved in anti-drug efforts in Bolivia during the 80s. US-led initiatives aimed to combat the production and trafficking of cocaine, which had a significant impact on Bolivia's internal affairs and relationships with the international community. Now, despite all these difficulties, there were young people from all over the world traveling South America in the 1980s with their backpacks, little money and a longing for adventure. Of course, backpacking tourism was very different back then from what we know nowadays. These were truly the heydays of lonely planet traveling. The young travelers depended on tips and tricks from more experienced travelers and they often had to rely on the kindness and help of locals. I don't know exactly why, but apparently a lot of Israeli youth could be found backpacking through South America and they had developed a system where they would often find a free place to sleep and cook in some Jewish community places. I think this is a practice that is deeply rooted in the Jewish tradition of hospitality. There is a concept known as Chachna Satrochim, which translates to welcoming guests in Hebrew. This value is considered a mitzvah, so a good deed or a commandment. Hospitality in the Jewish tradition often involves opening one's home to guests, providing a warm and welcoming environment. Offering food and refreshments to guests is a significant part of Jewish hospitality. That also includes preparing a meal, providing drinks, ensuring that the guest feels well taken care of. And this also includes a special emphasis on welcoming strangers. This practice is rooted in biblical teachings that encourage kindness to strangers. All this might also be connected to historical experiences of displacement and the need for refuge, because we know throughout history Jewish communities have faced periods of persecution, exile and forced migration. As a result, the value of hospitality became not only a cultural and religious practice, but also a practical necessity for survival. Absolutely. One of those young backpackers from Israel was a man named Yosef Yossi Ginsberg, who was born on the 15th of April, 1959, in Tel Aviv. His parents were Holocaust survivors. From a young age, Yossi was fascinated by stories of adventurers, especially the book Papillon by Henri Charrier, which made a lasting impression on him. So, Charrier claimed that Papillon was somewhat autobiographical. Henri, Papillon, in quotation marks, Charrier, was convicted of a crime he claimed he did not commit, the murder of a pimp. In 1931, he was sentenced to life imprisonment and transported to the notorious penal colony of Devil's Island in French Guiana. Charrier gained notoriety for his numerous escape attempts from the brutal conditions of Devil's Island. Despite being surrounded by shark-infested waters, dense jungles, and a reputation for being an inescapable prison, he made several daring efforts to regain his freedom. Papillon was released in 1945 due to a change in French penal policies, and he settled in Venezuela. He continued to live an adventurous life and wrote not only Papillon, but several other books. Papillon was definitely his most famous, however, and it was published in 1969. The book became an international bestseller and brought attention to the harsh conditions of the French penal system. Papillon means butterfly in French, symbolizing Charrier's quest for freedom. It's also um, the name of a tiny little dog breed. I love one. She's a little screamer, so shout out to Soph. I remember watching Papillon 
I mean the the original movie from 1973 because I think the, there's a remake. Is it a TV show remake mm. or is it a movie remake? I'm not sure. I'm talking about the one uh, with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. And I remember watching it when I, I was around 10 years old with my dad and I loved it and I still have a very fond memory of watching it for the first time. And yeah, my dad let me watch very grown-up movies at a very young age. Nothing gory or sick or something yeah. like that. He, But he definitely shaped my love for movies. Totally. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. I was about to say the same exact thing. I had completely forgotten about it until now. I can't remember if I... I think I watched it at Grandpa's house with everybody. Yeah, I totally forgot about it. I think I should maybe read it or rewatch it because I never read the book. And I don't think I've watched the film since I was a kid. All right. So young Yossi was super impressed by the book and by Henri Charrier in general, and he dreamed of visiting all the places that Papillon had described in his books. Yossi spent three years in the Israeli Navy, and when he was done with that, he tried to save enough money to travel through South America in the footsteps of Papillon, but also to explore the continent further. To earn the money, he took very adventurous jobs like construction work in Norway, fishing in Alaska, and loaning trucks in New York City. In 1981, so when Yossi was 22 years old, he had managed to save up enough money, and so he embarked on his big adventure. Yeah, like his life so far hasn't been adventurous enough. Right? Construction in Norway <laughs> and fishing in Alaska. But fishing in Alaska? Like what? So Yossi traveled from Venezuela to Colombia, and then on to Peru, and there... At the shores of Lake Titicaca, he met a Swiss backpacker by the name of Marcus Stamm. So Marcus was 28 years old at the time, born and raised in Schaffhausen, Switzerland. He was a semi-professional tennis player, apparently rather successful, a teacher and overall a very well-liked person, eager to help anyone who needed help, very empathetic. And he was traveling South America because his then-girlfriend of 10 years had kind of hinted that he needed to experience more things than just his monotonous life as a teacher in this Swiss town. So Mary, how he was called by his family and friends, packed his backpack and made his way to South America. His girlfriend had even traveled to meet up with him, but ultimately she ended the relationship and returned home. So Marcus was left there, heartbroken, but decided to continue his travels. And in Puno, situated at Lake Titicaca, he met Yossi. Yossi was on a boat that would take him to Takile, an island in the lake. This couple of excerpts are from Yossi Ginsburg's book and it describes the first moments he met Markus. Quote, Soon it was time to start. The pilot, an Indian, stuck out a long pole, which he used as both rudder and oar, and gestured to the boy to cast off the rope securing the nose of the boat and push us away from the dock. Espera, espera! A mochilero running, panting, cried breathlessly and climbed down into the boat. I almost missed it, he said to the Indian in Spanish. Gracias. He sat beside me and as I moved to make room for him, he smiled at me. You're Israeli, he said in English. How could you tell? I knew right off. You Israelis have taken to the roads in droves. My name is Yossi, I said. Nice to meet you. I'm Marcus. I came here straight from the train station. Lucky for me, I caught the boat. I would have had to wait a whole day for the next one. Marcus went on talking as if we were old friends. I pulled a roll, some cheese and an orange out of my pack and offered them to him. He made himself a sandwich of the roll and cheese and ate hungrily. The orange was his dessert. I'll pay you back when we get to the island. Marcus turned to the Germans and had a lively conversation with them in their language. Then he turned to the French group and spoke French with them. He had a compelling personality and in no time we were all acquainted, talking and joking like him. Are you German? I asked him. Swiss, he replied. We were almost to the island when the boat broke down. The engine just went dead. The boatman quickly located the trouble and before long he had the engine running again. Marcus noticed that he had injured his finger during the repair, however, and whipped a first aid kit out of his pack. He disinfected the Indian's finger and asked me to cut a strip of adhesive tape. But no, my efforts weren't precise enough. He took the roll himself and cut a neater strip, just so, then went back to his bandaging. The man thanked him with a wide smile. End quote. Marcus and Yossi became quick friends and even though Yossi had actually planned to travel on to Machu Picchu, he decided that the famous ruins could wait a little while longer. 
and he travels to La Paz instead with Marcus. And I think this is a good moment for a quick break for a word by the sponsor of this episode, The Art of Crime. Oh, it's so good. You might remember a while back we already told you about this wonderful podcast when their first season dropped. Well, so many of you listened that the host, Gavin, wanted us to tell you about it again, and we are happy to. Yeah, we are so glad to tell you that this podcast is back with the third season, and it's another fascinating topic. I just know our Hellions will love this. This season is titled Queen of Crime, and it's all about Marie Großholz. Who's that, you might ask? Well, most of you will know her under the name Madame Tussaud. That's right. This season, it's all about the wax-coated world of Madame Tussaud and the macabre tales she brought to life. We all know the name, but few of us realize the historical significance of her wax museum. And even fewer appreciate how she redefined the genre of true crime. From pre-revolutionary France to Victorian London, the art of crime unravels all the layers of Tussaud's career. Discover how she won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the reign of terror, and became one of the most celebrated show women in London. But that's not all. Of course, they also delve into the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, where Tussauds Museum exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear tales of the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Make the art of crime your second go-to history podcast and listen to Gavin unraveling the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, you can also follow them on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube for even more content. And the most important part, check out their webpage, artofcrimepodcast.com, where you will find plenty more information. Yeah, there you'll find transcripts, bibliographies, and images for each episode. Dive deep into the stories with the art of crime. Okay, so Yossi and Marcus are now in La Paz, Bolivia, and there they run into an American photographer, a 29-year-old man from Oregon named Kevin Gale. And Kevin and Marcus had previously encountered each other on their travels through South America, so they were already pretty good friends and happy to see each other. I think it's safe to say that Kevin, though, was the most experienced backpacker of them all, yeah? I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. This is how Yossi describes meeting Kevin Gale for the first time. Quote, It was the first time I had met Kevin, but I already knew quite a lot about him. Every traveler did. Among the mochileros, he was a legend. Kevin Gale had done it all. They said that he carried the heaviest pack in South America, that he walked faster than the llamas up the side of the mountains. He was an enthusiastic naturalist and photographer. And one more thing, he was Marcus's best friend. End quote. Uh, by the way, just if some listeners are wondering what the mochileros are that he keeps mentioning, it's the Spanish word for backpackers. The mm. mochila is the backpack. So Kevin is this very outdoorsy sort of guy, and he definitely has more experience in the wilderness than Marcus or Yossi. But Kevin wasn't the only new acquaintance that Yossi made in La Paz. One day, he was approached by a man in his mid-30s who introduced himself as Carl, Carl Rupp Rector. But I don't have the right guttural, I, you know, I can't, I'm on decongestants. <laughs> And my mouth is like the Sahara. Karl Ruprechter. I just have to Ruprechter. Karl. <laughs> it's going to clear your sinuses right up. It will. It will. Karl Ruprechter. Nope. You should just say it. So his name is Karl Ruprechter. Karl? Yeah. Ruprechter. Yeah. I can get the... Yeah, but I can't get the... It's That's fine. Down. You're American. Okay. We accept that. It's better than you sing Rupp Rector. Oh, yeah. No, it's Carl Rupp Rector. I can see that. Yeah. But like, it's, <laughs> I can't get the, <sighs> the sound. It's fine. <clears throat> it's hard. All right. So Carl Rupp Rector is an Austrian geologist. 
and he tells Yossi that he was about to set out for another expedition into the Amazonian rainforest to look for gold and uranium, something he had done many times before. He claimed that he knew the area well, just like the back of his hand. He also claimed that in his previous travels to the area, he had encountered an undiscovered indigenous tribe. Yossi was enthralled by Carl's stories. These were exactly the kind of adventures that he wanted to experience. Carl suggested that he join him on his next expedition, and that he could even bring some friends along. Yossi was hooked immediately and asked Marcus to join him. Marcus was like, um, you know what? No, thanks. Not really interested in walking into the jungle. But Yossi convinced him that this was a -a once-in-a-lifetime chance to experience something not many would ever have a chance to experience, especially the part about visiting an indigenous tribe that hadn't had contact with the outside world, apart from Karl Ruprechter. So after a while, Marcus was like, all right, I'll come with you. Marcus asked Kevin if he was interested, and I don't think Kevin needed a lot of convincing. He had actually promised his mother that he would return home for Christmas, but this was exactly the kind of thing he was looking for and the kind of photos he was hoping to take. So everything was set. They had even managed to purchase a hunting rifle. Apparently, that was not legal in Bolivia at the time to own any firearms. At least that's the best we could figure uh, and what we read in Yossi's book. We looked into a bit more, but gun laws have really changed in Bolivia a lot over the decades. I think. Nowadays, you can own them with a license, but in any case, they were able to get a hunting rifle because you're walking into the jungle. You want, you want something to protect yourself. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. But then Carl tells Yossi, hey, listen, sorry, man, I've got some bad news. My uncle runs a farm somewhere in Bolivia, and he sent me a letter that he needs me, and I'm expected there next month. There's just not enough time for me to do this expedition. And Yossi is really upset about this because he was so looking forward to this adventure. And he tells Carl, listen, you still have a month until you have to be at your uncle's. So how about we hire you as our guide and do you take us to the tribe and we pay you for this expedition? And Carl is like, "Mm, I don't know, but you know what? Yeah, if it's important to you, let's do it. I'll do it. So Kevin and Marcus are informed of the change of plan, and they're all fine with it because now they're not just tagging along, but they can actually sort of decide where they want to go and how long they want to stay there, right? I feel this so deeply. It's why I'm usually not very keen on hitching a ride uh, somewhere with a friend because then I can't decide how long I want to stay and when I want to go home. And yeah, uh, Yeah. I I feel this. Yes. So the expedition started, according to the book, started on 4th of November, I think, somewhere in the beginning of November of 1981. But before that, Yossi, Kevin and Marcus went to their respective embassies to inform them of their plans, uh, the route they were planning on taking and when they had planned on being back. And that was a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you go somewhere, always let others know these things. EOC also wrote a letter to his older brother Moshe, informing him of his plans and asking him to not tell their parents about it. He just didn't want to scare them, Mm -hmm. so he asked Moshe to make up a story why they wouldn't receive a letter for the next few weeks. This is part of the letter where Yossi explains the plan to his brother. Quote, Now the main thing I want to tell you is about another kind of trip I'm leaving on tomorrow. I don't want it to sound like I'm over-dramatizing, but it could be very dangerous. I might even be risking my life. That's the kind of letter you want to get from your brother. I'll be gone between four to six weeks, and I won't be riding home during that time. Think of something to tell mom and dad so that they won't worry. Ugh, the worst. It's like, oh great, now I'm complicit in this. I'm taking a flight tomorrow from La Paz to Apollo with three other guys. Kevin Gale, age 29, American. Markus Stamm, age 28, Swiss. Karl Ruprechter, age about 35, Austrian. The American and Swiss guys are very good friends of mine. The Austrian is a geologist. He has been working in Bolivia for the past nine years looking for gold and uranium and other precious metals in the jungle. He is coming with us as our paid guide. 
He has an uncle with a ranch in Bolivia. The uncle's name is Josef Ruprechter and his address is Santa Rosa Range, El Progreso Reyes. From Apollo we will walk to a village called Asriamas on the Tuiki River. I'm planning to fly from Rivaralta, the last place on our route, back to La Paz and take a train and buses from there to Uncle Nello in Sao Paulo. If I haven't called home by the first week in January, something has happened to me. I'm sure that everything will go right and there's nothing to worry about. I'm being somewhat melodramatic, but wanted you to know all the details just in case. Tell mom and dad that I've gone to some little island or village up in the mountains for a month. Try to think of something that won't worry them, because I won't be writing at all. Tell them you got a letter and that I feel fine. End quote. At least someone in the family knows what's going on. Smart. So, on the 4th of November, the four get on a small plane that was taking them to Apollo, a town 250 miles or 400 kilometers north of La Paz. Apollo was their starting point near the Tweaky River. Apollo is surrounded by dense rainforest, making it an ideal gateway for those seeking to explore the vast and relatively untouched wilderness. And I'm sure you heard the story of 17-year-old Juliane Köpke, who survived a plane crash in the Peruvian rainforest. Yes, amazing. For those of you who don't know, she survived 11 days and was eventually rescued. Uh, that happened sometime in the 1970s. I learned about this story in high school, in English class, and it gave me actual nightmares. To this day, the Amazonian rainforest, as beautiful, important, and magnificent it is, is a place I would never voluntarily set foot in. How about you? So, I would love to visit, but in a very managed, safe trip to the outskirts kind of a thing, you know? But you hate the outdoors. I know. But like, if it's, like I said, if there's like a trail. I did in Costa Rica go like walking through a rainforest with guides. It's this place where they release animals that have been rehabilitated from the pet trade. And so that was really cool. But like we drove there and then, you know, walked a fairly short distance through on trails. I would never, never walk into a jungle or even a forest. I cannot overemphasize my resistance to any situation which might end with a spider web in my face. <laughs> I once accidentally swam face first into jellyfish tentacles in Cape Cod Bay and then had to sit on the beach with my eyes swollen shut, listening to my friends debate who should pee on my face. I would seriously, intentionally swim into jellyfish tentacles again, rather than walk into a spider web. Because I've also done that, and I was naked by the time I hit the back door. And I don't know how many of my neighbors saw what. This is the old house in Wayland. It wasn't pretty. So, mm -mm. nope. No. No. But these young men... These four guys, thinking themselves as big adventurers, they're ready. They don't care if they take a spider to the face. They're just thrilled to be there. <laughs> they're just happy. They're yeah. just happy to be there. And the Bolivian rainforest, let's talk about that. So it's primarily located in the Amazon basin. It's part of the larger Amazon rainforest, and it covers a significant portion of the country. Bolivia has about 230,000 square miles or 600,000 precious, precious square kilometers of Amazon rainforest, making it one of the countries with the largest Amazonian territory. You can find an incredible variety of wildlife out there, even more so in the 1980s. Probably jaguars, pumas, ocelots, tapirs, capybaras, and various monkey species like howlers, spider monkeys, and capuchins. Additionally, the rainforest is a haven for an incredible variety of bird species, including toucans, parrots, and harpy eagles. The rivers are inhabited by diverse aquatic life, including caimans, anacondas, and numerous fish species like piranhas. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. We haven't done a piranha episode yet. It's on my list. Of course, the Bolivian rainforest is home to many species classified as endangered or vulnerable, including the Bolivian river dolphin, the giant otter, and various species of turtles and tortoises. Conservation efforts are essential to protect these vulnerable populations. 
The Bolivian rainforest, like any dense and wild ecosystem, poses certain dangers. It is home to venomous snakes, insects, and large predators, like the aforementioned jaguar. But that's not the only danger. There are waterfalls, mudslides, and of course, quicksand. Quicksand! Additionally, the very serious risk of tropical diseases, like malaria and dengue fever, is always a concern. So it's definitely a hostile environment for those unfamiliar with it. But thank dog, the three men have such an experienced guide in Carl Ruprechter. Right? Right? Mm, Right? We shall see. Mm. Mm. So the four start in Apollo, following the Twiki River to a settlement called Asariamas. And from there, they continue on following the Asariamas River upstream and crossing the mountains. But the journey is hard, very hard, maybe even harder than the three had expected. Lots of rain, food scarcity, and the difficult terrain exhaust the group more and more. Especially the food scarcity was rough. After all, Carl had promised the three men that there is plenty of fruits and game they would be able to find, and that there is no way that they would ever experience hunger in the rainforest, because there is just an abundance of food to be found. Especially Marcus seems not to be too happy with the whole situation for several reasons. I think he was the more cautious one. He was wanting to make sure that everyone was okay all the time. Like he was the kind of person who would ask, are you okay? Are you hurt? This kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. He was also the more empathetic one when it came to local wildlife and fauna. He would often refuse to eat the animals Carl had killed and prepared for them. There is one instance that, for me at least, uh, really shows what kind of person Marcus was. The group finds a fruit on the ground, a mysterious jungle fruit. I think later it, it was found out that it was properly, probably cocoa. It was cocoa? Like coconuts? No, not coconuts. Cocoa, like for chocolate. Oh, chocolate. Gotcha. Sorry, of course. Cocoa, right? Yeah. Cow, cow. Cow, cow. So they cut it open and they divide it up between them and they eat it, which is, if it was really cocoa, uh, yeah. cacao, that's smart because that gives a lot of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And then they were looking for the tree because there must be a tree where that fruit came from and they find the tree, but they realize they can't get the fruits because they are too high up and the tree is too slick so they can't climb it. So then they decide to cut down the whole tree to get the fruits. And only Marcus is against it because he argues that it's not right to cut down a whole tree just to get them to, um, you know, get a few fruits. Right. He also says maybe in the future some other people would come along and would be able to nourish themselves on a fruit found on the ground. And I'm, I so get this mindset he has. I, that, that would be exactly what would go through my head probably. Same. Yeah. Yeah, but he's outvoted and they cut down the tree only to realize that the fruits are not ripe yet and that they can't eat any of them. So the whole tree and all the fruits are wasted for nothing. Like, I get both sides here, Mm -hmm. but, you know, in hindsight. Yeah. Of course, some of you might think Marcus was in the right. Others may think that he was extremely foolish. After all, they were in the jungle and they needed to feed themselves. The group definitely were in the second camp, thinking Marcus was foolish, and they start to get super annoyed with their friend. They think that he shouldn't have come on this trip, that he's just not cut out for such an expedition. And there is a lot of tension starting to build up in the group, and me, personally, I can relate to that. I have felt this kind of frustration and alienation from friends in stressful situations, and they were not even a fraction as stressful as what these people experience. I'm not proud of it, but I think it's also somewhat of a normal human reaction to these kind of things. Yeah. And not only does Marcus annoy them with his caution and his ethics, he also starts to slow them down. They have a problem keeping their feet warm and dry, and their shoes and socks are constantly wet because they have to cross uh, rivers and streams very often. And most of you will know exactly what that means, jungle rot. Not to be confused with the infamous trench foot, but it shares some similar characteristics. Yeah, and to be fair, we don't know exactly what problems Marcos had with his feet. We know that there was something wrong with them, and it could possibly have been either jungle rot or trench foot. Jungle rot, also known as, if my sister Moose is listening or anyone else with like a foot ick, just skip this part, okay? 
So jungle rot, also known as tropical ulcers or tropical pyomyositis, is a bacterial or fungal infection that can occur in warm and humid tropical environments. It's not directly caused by wet conditions, but can develop in areas with high temperatures and humidity. Jungle rot typically presents as skin ulcers or sores, often accompanied by pain, swelling, and a foul odor. The condition can affect the skin and underlying tissues, and to prevent it, you need to maintain good hygiene, keep the skin dry, and avoid cuts and injuries. Treatment includes addressing the infection with appropriate medication, wound care, and sometimes surgical intervention. Trench foot is also known as immersion foot, on the other hand. It is caused by prolonged exposure to cold, damp conditions. So hot and damp, jungle rot. Cold and damp, trench foot, right? It was initially observed in soldiers during World War I who spent extended periods in wet and muddy trenches. Trench foot involves impaired blood circulation, cold and numb feet, swelling, redness, pain, and in severe cases, it can lead to tissue damage or gangrene. Again, you need to keep your feet clean, dry, and warm. This means changing into dry socks and footwear regularly and avoiding prolonged exposure to wet conditions. Treatment includes warming and drying the affected feet, along with medical attention when necessary. Yes, please, people, keep your feet dry if you're Mm -hmm. in this kind of outdoorsy situations. So there are a lot of problems, a lot of tension in the group itself. Markus has just about had it. He wants to turn around and go back. Carl, the super duper guide, is wearing cowboy boots and his boots are starting to dissolve. Why do I have the feeling that cowboy boots might not be the adequate footwear for a jungle expedition? I mean, cowboy boots have their time and place, Yeah. but maybe the jungle is not really it. So his soles are are like kind of getting loose and he uses a rope to keep the sole from falling off. And that sounds so unpleasant to walk, Oh God! to be honest. Yeah. And he's like, you know what? I'm okay with heading back to the settlement to get new boots. But if you want to go on, I can go on. No biggie at all. Yossi, of course, wants to keep going. He is really into the idea of meeting some indigenous tribes. So it all comes down to Kevin. He is the deciding vote. And he's an outdoors adventurer, but he also can see that their circumstances at the moment are not the best. And so he decides that it's best to return to the settlement and regroup and rethink of what they're going to do. And yeah, that's what they do. So they return to Asariamas. And I think this is the perfect moment to stop for this week. Next week, we'll be back with the fate of Yossi, Markus, Kevin and Carl. Don't miss it because this is wild. It's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You have something good? I do. I just had a really nice family trip and it was great. It was, we had a really, really nice time. And a real highlight was we had a stop in Cozumel and we were able to visit a, thanks to your warnings about the, how I wanted to go to Ishkaret, right? And then realized that because of where we were docked in Cozumel, it would be really difficult. And there was kind of a a rough ferry. And so we opted to stay, see the ruins at San Gervasio, which were absolutely beautiful. And that was the temple to the goddess Ishshel. And I won a spicy lollipop because I knew how to pronounce the X in the Mayan because you had taught me. (laughs) I know. It was perfect. So it was really cool. It was really, really cool. It was absolutely beautiful. And I'm just always amazed when you go to these thousands year old, you know, site and this particular one, it's like the numbers because, you know, the Mayans and numbers were a big deal. But there's this gorgeous road and it's kind of a ruin now, but you can still see and picture it how it would have been back in the day. And they used stucco and they used limestone and they used crushed abalone shell to make it visible mm. at night because she was the goddess of the moon. And it was seven miles to the Caribbean Sea on the road. And then where we were was the halfway point, And then there was another seven miles to the next whatever it was. But it was very cool. I'm very glad we went. I love learning about I love this. the people that we've all descended from, you know, in one way or another. It's fascinating. 
I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. My something good is I've mentioned it in the group before New Year's, but I haven't talked about it on the on the podcast. I had a New Year's resolution and then I can hear you roll your eyes over there, out there in the world, because New Year's resolution, uh, this is a good one. Listen, I'm stacking up books and books and books beside my bed and I don't read them because I don't have time. Well, I do have time, but I don't take the time. I'm falling asleep, scrolling on my phone, which is horrible. So my, my New Year's resolution was to do, not do that in the evening anymore, but every evening, starting from January 1st, uh, reading at least one chapter in one of the books. Mm -hmm. It's been 17 days. I did it every day, well, every evening, at least one chapter, sometimes two, and I'm almost done with my first book. And this is a good New Year's awesome. resolution. It's a great New Year's yeah. resolution. I always read before bed. Yeah. I've always, since I was a child. I used to read so many books before we all started to have... Phones. Smartphones. Yeah. I have yeah. to. Otherwise, I can't shut my brain off. And if I'm really having a hard time sleeping, I'll go back to like some of the hard, like Shakespeare or Chaucer or stuff, you know, yeah. where it's a little bit... If I have to switch into iambic pentameter, I have a good chance of falling asleep faster. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great New Year's resolution. That's a really good, healthy one. All right. I think that's it, right? I think so. Please, if you enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, go to your podcast app and leave us a rating and or review. We love that. Go to our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. There you find all the links to our merch store, to our email, to our PO box, to our Facebook, to our Instagram, to our Patreon. Next Patreon get together for the murder tier will be on 30th of January. We're going to talk about the documentary, The Curious Case of Natalia Grace. Yeah. So come join us for that. A lot of thoughts on that one. Yep. Yeah. No, lots, lots of talk thoughts about. Ugh. Ugh. And that's it. Tell your pets we said hi. Yeah. Tell them we love them and miss them. Cuddle them, hug them, take them to the vet, feed them, give them treats. Be the best you can with them. This is the first episode, Johanna, that I've recorded with both my dogs sleeping. Oh, it's true. They're here. Oh, I so did not great. even once. They're sleeping in the other room. Not a peep. Not a peep. Yeah. I thought for sure the little one was going to come find me. I told yeah. you it's going to be like this pretty I know. soon. Perfect. I know. This is good. Be kind to other humans. That's right. Try to remember, I just got off a cruise ship, Johanna, and I kept thinking of you saying be kind to other people. And it's so true because I don't do well with crowds and I can get a little bit testy sometimes if I'm, you know. And the thing I always remind myself of is... We're all just in the same boat and we're all just trying to get out of here alive. Like the people around you aren't the enemy. The world is kind of your enemy. So yeah. try to see yourself on the same side with more people because you are. My mom always, if people say something stupid or act stupid, my mom always gets like super irritated with them. And she thinks everybody is like just um, doing stupid things on purpose, right? Yeah. And yes, some are, but I think the majority are just thoughtless and yeah. they don't mean anything by things they say. And I just, I don't know, lately I started to have these things roll off my back more easily. That takes me to the next point. Be kind to yourself. Yeah. Because that's truly so important. Yeah. Still working on that one. It's easier to be kind to others right now. <laughs> but, you know, it's progress, right? Yeah. And as Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep going, especially if you're in the Amazonian Amazon jungle. forest. Yeah. <sighs> what, just hold That's a rough. stick in front of you and wave it like a wand at all times in case there's yeah. a spider web. Okay. <laughs> Tschüss. Bye. <laughs>